and I invite you to follow along on the screen, in your bulletin, and of course in your Bible. Our scripture for passage this morning is Psalm 102 in its entirety. Hear now God's word. A prayer of one afflicted when he is faint and pours out his complaint before the Lord. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come up to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Incline your ear to me. Answer me speedily in the day when I call. For my days pass away like smoke, and my bones burn like a furnace. My heart is struck down like grass and has withered. I forget to eat my bread. Because of my loud groaning, my bones cling to my flesh. I am like a desert owl of the wilderness, like an owl of the waste places. I lie awake. I am like a lonely sparrow on the housetop. All the days my enemies taunt me. Those who deride me use my name for a curse. For I eat ashes like bread and mingle tears with my drink. Because of your indignation and anger, you have taken me up and thrown me down. My days are like an evening shadow. I wither away like grass. But you, O Lord, are enthroned forever. You are remembered through all generations. You will arise and have pity on Zion. It is the time to favor her. The appointed time has come. For your servants hold her stones dear and have pity in her dust. Nations will fear the name of the Lord. All the earth will fear your glory. For the Lord builds up Zion. He appears in his glory. He regards the prayer of the destitute, and he does not despise their prayer. Let this be recorded for a generation to come, so that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. That he looked down from his holy height, from heaven the Lord looked at the earth, to hear the groans of the prisoners, to set free those who were doomed to die, that they may declare in Zion the name of the Lord, and in Jerusalem his praise. When people gather together and nations to worship the Lord, he has broken my strength in mid-course. He has shortened my days. O oh my God, I say, take not away, take me not away in the midst of my days, for whose years endure throughout all generations? Of old you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe, and they will pass away. But you are the same, and your years have no end. The children of your servants shall dwell secure. Their offspring shall be established before you. This is the word of the Lord. I don't know if you guys noticed, but there's a playground out there. One day, I was working on my sermon, and this was happening. They were they were putting it, and then a couple days later, they put the underlayment down, and they had these amazing tubes, the mulch into the space. Like you didn't have to. How many were there when we built the first playground over at the old building? It was pouring rain for ten hours or whatever, and we just we were, we used shovels back then. You know what shovels are? They, so we didn't need that this time. It's much easier. And here's the finished product. And I just want to say um, thank you to uh, to you all who have um, been so generous because there there's the organ and uh, the kitchen is is finished and the playground is out there. Those were three things that we didn't have when we came into the building. They've since been accomplished and. Um, uh, many of you know Charlie Bartleme. He's our youth leader, and he and his wife Rachel live in that house over there. They have a little sweet daughter, Emma. And Emma, um, of anybody who's excited about the playground, I would say that Emma believes that it's her personal playground. And she, like, you can see it. That's Monday. Like, wistful longing for that thing. And all of her longings and hopes were um, complete. Uh, just yesterday, when she swang in the swing, and you see that that um, look on her face 
joy, longing, beauty in life, uh, it's, a, it's a good thing. Amen? And yet, that is not always the way things go in this life. And we are in this series called Summer in the Psalms. We're looking at a different psalm every Sunday um, throughout the warm months of June, July, August. And um, there are 150 psalms right in the middle of your, your Bible, and they cover all the range of human experience and emotions. They are a, a prayer book of the Bible, and we all would do well to study them and to incorporate them in our prayer lives. John Calvin put it this way, said the Psalms are an anatomy of all the parts of the soul. All the parts of the soul. And, um, you know, here we're going to look at a psalm not of, of tremendous joy and gratitude, but a psalm of, of affliction and pain. So let's pray, and then we'll take a look at Psalm 102. Father, we thank you so much for gathering us here together. It is a great privilege to be here. We pray that you would help us to attend to your word. I pray, Lord, in particular for those who are here, who are in grief, who are in the midst of tremendous pain and affliction. I pray that you would comfort them. And Lord, for those of us uh, who are not, we pray that this psalm would be a great resource if and when the time does come. And for many of us, we joys and things to be thankful for while we are struggling in different Lord, to understand that you are sovereign over it all and help us to cry out to you when we are in pain. Now come, Spirit, and, and fill us and help us to not only hear these words, but to apply them to our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, life may be going very well for you right now. You might be young and all the up and up, and it feels like you're going to conquer, go from strength to strength, and if that is you, praise the Lord. That's a good place to be. Others of us may be middle-aged or older, and yet we've had incredible lives. We've been blessed in all kinds of ways. And if, if that is some of you, well, praise the Lord for that too. Um, but eventually, it is extremely likely, if not guaranteed, that we will be in a situation like that of the writer of Psalm 102. And for those of us who are affliction, it's comforting to know that this is a psalm that not only the psalmist, uh, we don't know who wrote it, but he wrote it uh, not only for himself, but for all of God's people. And we see that in the, the header at the top, and I'm, I'm going to go through verse by verse, um, if you would pull out your bulletins and just follow along with, with me. Right where it says Psalm 102, it says, a prayer of one afflicted, one who is afflicted. The, the Hebrew word is ana or ani, and it, um, it looks like this. And the definition is to find oneself in a stunted, humble, and lowly position. And as I said, that uh, will be all of us at one time or another. And I think sometimes among Christians there's discomfort to express emotions such as anger toward God, sorrow, uh, distress. And uh, it's almost as though we feel like um, these emotions expose sort of a weakness of faith, you know, or, or we, we, we have unbelief if we are experiencing pain and we're crying out to God for help and we wonder where He is. Um, but the truth is, we all face these kinds of situations eventually, and we, we all are afflicted at one point in our lives or another. And, and just to, to give kind of a fine point on James Luther Mays, he, he talks about the afflicted. And may, maybe this is you right now. The afflicted are the needy, the poor, the lowly, the humble, who know that they cannot save themselves and depend upon the Lord for help against forces with which they cannot cope. They can't deal with it. They can't. It's overwhelming. Life is overwhelming. And for you who feel that way, this is a psalm that you can pray if you are feeling faint. In other words, if you are feeling like you're, you're at your wit's end, you can pour out this complaint to the Lord. And so here's, here's what he says. Uh, there's five different movements throughout this, this psalm. The first one is when he cries out, Hear me, God. Hear me, God. And I want you to notice that in this verses 1 and 2, there are five different commands. Now, normally, when we hear a commandment in the, in the Bible, it's a commandment that God gives to people, to us. 
here, it is the psalm is commanding God. And this is another way where you feel like, oh, I don't know that that's theologically correct. Here it is, right in your Bible. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Incline your ear to me. Answer me speedily in the day when I call. It, it, I want you to picture like a, a, a little uh, daughter, three years old, grabbing her dad's face and saying, Listen to me, Dad. I, I want to tell you something. It, it's that, that kind of uh, emotion and, and expression. It is a, an, an, a request, a command to listen. Don't hide your face from me in the day of distress. That word for distress in the Hebrew is sarar, and it, it means something that is narrow or confining. So you're in a tight spot. You, you're experiencing the vice grip of, of life right now. And it's this, this command to listen, to hear, to act now. And, and this is how we are encouraged to pray. To demand that God act now to get us out of whatever we are going through, and then, and then the psalmist says, I, "I'm hurt, God. I'm hurt." I think part of what, what's interesting about the psalm is there's no great sin that, that he's repenting of. You know, there, there's not. It, he doesn't see, well, I did this wrong, therefore this is happening to me. It's not that. At all. There's no real causal link that we that we are aware of. I think that's part of the, the biggest challenge of suffering is we don't know why it's happening a lot of the time. And, and we won't know in, in this time until we stand before Him. And there's so many people who, who struggle and suffer in our time. Uh, mental health issues are off the charts compared to years past. And, and why is this happening? Why am I going through this? Um, that answer is not given in the psalm, but still there is this, this explanation of the pain that's being experienced. And this too is something we are encouraged to do. Let's just walk through it. It says in verse 3, my days pass away like smoke. Like they're just, my days are gone before me and, and my bones burn like a furnace. We have no idea what was being experienced physically, but, but that sounds like some great malady like cancer or some bones burn like a furnace. My heart is struck down like grass and has withered. This is a, an expression of the, the temporariness of, of life. Often in the Bible, grass is a metaphor for just how quickly it goes. Isaiah 40, the grass withers, the flowers fall. All flesh is like grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And he can see that um, his life is is perhaps coming to a close. It says, I forget to eat my bread. Have you ever been in a situation where you were so low that you lost your appetite? You no longer wanted to eat. That's what he's experiencing. Because of my loud groaning, my bones cling to my flesh. Again, this physical sickness. And it's not only the physical sickness and the grief. It's that, well, he says, I'm like a desert owl of the wilderness, like an owl of the waste places. And then, says in verse 7b, I am like a lonely sparrow on the housetop, experiencing this seemingly alone, like a desert owl. I remember, uh, I have a memory going back to when I was probably 10 years old, and I was staying uh, at my Grandma Milroy's house, and she lived out in the country, kind of by Indian Lake. I remember one morning waking up and going outside, and I heard this owl hooting in the wilderness, dead silent, except for this owl, and it, it struck me as like one of the loneliest sounds I've ever heard in my life, saying that this, this is how he, he feels. He's utterly alone, or at least he feels that way. He lies awake. Raise your hand if you've had a hard time sleeping any time in the last month or so. Insomnia is often uh, an express. I mean, the reason why we don't sleep well is because we're anxious, and we we fall, well, we might be middle-aged and have to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. And then we go back to bed and our minds are just racing. And um, why is that? Well, and if you don't experience that and you're like, you are old, just wait, okay? Just wait. It will happen to you too. But we, we lie awake out of anxiety. Not only that, but all the day, verse, my enemies taunt me. Those who deride me 
use my name for a curse. People are talking trash about me, talking behind my back. If you've ever had that experience of people utterly misunderstanding you and thinking that you are nasty or mean or for one reason or another, it is not a pleasant experience. And this is what's happening to him. Things are so bad that, you know, ashes are a symptom of grief. I eat ashes like bread. Mingle tears with my, my drink. And then in verse 10, listen to what it says. Because of your indignation, he's talking to God right now. Because of your indignation and anger, you have taken me up and thrown me down. In some sense, he's saying that God is at least some part of this. Now, I, I want to explain this because we believe in the absolute sovereignty of God. Amen? He's in charge of everything. And he's good all the time. God is good and all the time. And yet, you and I experience tremendous hardship sometimes. And at the very least, we have to... Now, God is not the author of evil and He does not sin. There is no light. There is no darkness in Him. There's only light. But we do have to say, in the end, that God allows a tremendous amount of pain in the world. And some of that pain visits, visits us. And so the psalmist is saying that, you know, this is what, what God has allowed. And, and he ends with this, my, my days like an evening shadow, I wither away like grass. His life is, is ebbing away. This is all a picture of tremendous pain that he is in. And um, he is praying to the God who he says has taken him up and thrown him down. Now, I, I don't know if you, um, in, in thinking about the sovereignty of God, if you wonder sometimes if God is in control of everything, then why do we pray? Anybody asked that question before? You ever thought of that? I know I, I've thought about that. About that and, and look, here's, here's the answer. Um, we don't know how it works. God is completely sovereign, and we are called and commanded to pray, and we are called and commanded to never stop praying, and somehow, in the infinite wisdom of God, He uses our prayers to bring about His will. Nobody in the Bible struggled with this and said, well, philosophically, in a detached way, I'm just going to stop praying because I don't really understand how it works. God's in control anyway. No. Jesus, over and over, commands us to pray and keep praying and never give up praying. And so he does this even in the midst of his pain, and you and I are to do the same. So uh, often, though, we, we, we tend not to do this. Here, here's what John Calvin again says. He says when, that, that we are all too apt at such times to shut our affliction up in our breast, which can only aggravate the trouble and embitter the mind against God. A better way is disburdening our cares to Him, pouring out our hearts before Him. Do you pour out your heart when you are in the midst of trouble? Do you lay yourself before the living God and tell Him how hard things are and tell Him that now is the time to move? I want to encourage you to do that if you are in the midst of a great struggle, trial, and, and some people really benefit from the discipline, the spiritual discipline of journaling, of writing down your prayers. I encourage you to do that as well. We are to come to God, to tell Him that we are hurting. He knows it, but we come to Him anyway. We take the time to express these things. And, and then uh, there's a shift, a shift to, to saying that we collectively need help, O oh God. And I, I want you to notice that He has focused on His own pain uh, and described it in great detail, these, these wonderful metaphors. But in verse 12, there's a shift. He says, But you, O Lord, are enthroned forever. You are remembered throughout all generations. God is still on His throne. And brothers and sisters, eventually we need to turn to the God who is eternal and infinite and good. We don't want to focus on ourselves so much that we neglect to turn to the living God. We have to remember to turn to Him, and that's what the psalmist does in this shift. And then he says, you will arise and have pity on Zion. So this is not a personal plea. This is a plea for the entirety of His people. 
specifically the people of Zion, which is the city of Jerusalem, the city of God, where the temple is. I mean, once uh, throughout Israel's history, Zion, Jerusalem, was harassed and besieged, and and they often were in trouble and needed help from the enemies of God's people. And and so he says, you you will. It's, it's, it's as if in hope he's talking God into it. You will arise and have pity on Zion. It is the time to favor her. The appointed time has come. This sounds incredibly audacious to tell God that now is the time, not the appointed time. And, and yet, there he is, having this real conversation with God. For your servants, hold her stones dear and have pity on her dust. He loves the city. He loves his people. He loves the place of the city of Jerusalem. And he, again, is persuading God to act for his own glory. Nations will fear the name of the Lord. In verse 15, all the kings of the earth will fear your glory. For the Lord builds up Zion. He appears in his glory. He regards the prayer of the destitute and does not despise their prayer. If you are destitute, God does not despise your prayers. And it's the rest of the section is a, it's a plea and an assurance that God is going to arise and He will declare in Zion the name of the Lord in Jerusalem His praise and peoples gather together in kingdoms to worship the Lord. This is a vision that is not like it is in the present for the psalmist, but in the future when people will worship and God will be glorified. I think this is a very helpful section of the psalm when I think about not Jerusalem per se, although we ought to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, but for our own country. Um, it seems to me we slowly, not even slowly, going insane as a culture. As we, as the leaders of our institutions are increasingly exposed to being corrupt, as our, our um, culture celebrates the murder of babies, as over and over we're told to take pride in certain things that God commands as wrong, as sinful. And so to pray that our nation would be turned around is entirely right in God. We ought to pray for those things. We ought to pray that instead of pride, we would be brought low and humbled. That in our arrogance, we would turn and turn back to the living God. Uh, there are incredible revivals in the history of this nation. It begins with repentance. May it begin with God's household repentance in our hearts and sincerity of humility. And may that work itself out into this country that we are blessed to live in. Praying that the Lord would heal this land is entirely right and good. He turns back to himself and his time feels like it is cut short in verses 23 and 24. I officiated a funeral, a memorial service, not yesterday, but the Saturday before here. And it was the first one that we've had here in, in the building. And it was for my aunt and my uncle. My aunt died earlier this year. She's 93. My uncle died a, a few years ago and this was during COVID. And so we finally got the whole family together and we had a joint memorial service there. Siblings, my my um, my mom's older siblings, and my uncle Val died in, in his late 80s. My aunt Lee in her early 90s. What a blessing to live that long. That's a great gift. And still, there were tears shed. Sad to say goodbye. Well, that's because death is a it's, it's a in some ways but it's a terror in other ways, and it will be both of those until we stand before the living God. This is Dietrich von Hildebrand in his book, um, the, the Jaws of Death, the Gate of Heaven. He says this, The decisive, mysterious event called death will become a reality for each, for each of us. The fact is certain. Only the date is veiled. We don't know when it's going to come. To some, it comes all too early in uh, you see, the, there, there's probably one of the greatest expressions of the brokenness of our world is when parents bury their children. It's a terrible thing. 
It's a terrible thing when life is cut off seemingly in the middle of the course. When in, in the midst of one's days, um, death comes to someone who has not yet lived the fullness of life. That is a, a terrible thing. And we, we all have a normal of expectations and assumptions about life. We want to live uh, long lives, and we want to be like Abraham in Genesis, where it says he lived a life full of days and was gathered to his people when he died. We all want that, and yet it doesn't happen for everyone. And so one of the one of the great pains of life is being taken in mid-course. Um, I don't think it is bad to pray for and long for normal life, a normally lived life, which in our time to live 70, 80, 90 years is a great blessing. And so to, to ask for that is not selfishness. It is to acknowledge the goodness of life. And the psalmist is perhaps going to be taken away in the midst of his days. What a what peace that is. And then he turns back to the living God. And though his time is cut short, There is one who is timeless. He says, you, in verse 24, be you whose years endure throughout all generations. Though our days are numbered, we don't know how many we have. There is one whose days have, he's lived forever. He's never never had a beginning. He will never have an end. And he is the only one in whom we find security. Of old, you laid the foundation of the earth, the heavens, are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will wear out like a garment. The earth is very old. If you are told that you are as old as dirt, that's not a compliment of your opinion. The, the earth is very old. It is nothing compared to the ageless, timeless, living, eternal God. He saw the beginning. He created all that is. And he will be there at the end of all things. And so, knowing that he's going to die, should we find our hope in the next new car that we buy? Or the next vacation that we're going to enjoy? Or the next great meal out? Those are great gifts. It's great to receive them. But don't find your hope in those things. There's only one place to find hope. And that's in the timeless, ageless, He's our only security. And how do we know Him? We know Him best. Yes, through His revealed Word, but even more through the One who came, the Eternal Son, who came as the Word come flesh. And one day He was preaching to the hundreds of people around. He's such a great preacher. People came from all over to hear Him. And he's preaching and he's, he's telling them that, you know, you what happened to our ancestors, how they left Egypt and they wandered for 40 years. And how were they, how were they made to continue to live? Well, God gave them this bread, manna. And then he said in John chapter 6, I am, hearkening back to Yahweh, the, the name Yahweh, I am the bread of heaven. And unless you eat my flesh, my blood, you cannot have eternal life. And you know what uh, all those hundreds of people said when he said that? It was weird. We're, we're, we're leaving. And all that were left were the disciples. And Jesus, I, I think, filled with this emotion, this pathos, said, and, and you too, are, are you going to leave too? And Peter said what every single one of us should say, Lord, to whom shall we go? You, you alone, have the words of the time. If you are worried, anxious, fearful, there is but one place where you can find security. You can be secure in the timeless one alone, through Christ alone, by faith alone. He is the one who will make sure, who will fulfill the promise that the children, in verse 28, the children of your servants shall dwell secure, their offspring shall be established before you. Why do we know that is true? Here's why. Because Jesus became afflicted for the afflicted ones who had no hope. Look in verses 19 and 20. God looked down from His holy height. From heaven the Lord looked at the earth. 
to hear the groans of the prisoners, to set free those who were doomed to die. That's all of us doomed to die on our own. And Jesus came to rescue us. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He went to the cross. He paid for our sins, and he rose victoriously. Death, sin, and hell for you and for me. And every day, he poured out his life for us. For this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Brothers and sisters, we are secure only in Christ. There are unpredictable and brutal afflictions in life. And we know that we, the children of God, through faith in Christ, are secure because of what Jesus has done for us. So, bring your cries to the living God. Tell Him the time is now to heal. I need help, God. And trust that He can and will heal you according to His will. But if in His mysterious providence, He does not heal, He does not bring you out of your affliction, and you go to the grave, know that whether we live or whether we die, we are the one. We belong to you. Father, we thank you that you have promised us that in life or death, that promise is not true for everyone. It is true only for those who acknowledge themselves to be sinners, indeed to be afflicted, to be without hope for salvation, who cry out to You, Jesus, and who trust in Your death and in Your resurrection for eternal life. You are the bread of life. We trust and we, we receive You, Jesus. I pray, Lord, for anyone here who, who does not yet know You, through repentance and faith. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that You would come. That You would move in people's hearts to convert them to faith in Christ. Even right now. For we who who are Your children, who know You, Father, by faith in Your Son, Jesus, and the power of the Holy Spirit, would You help us affliction, persevere, to trust in Your goodness, cry out to You and to trust that You are working out all things for the good of those who love us. Father, hear us now as we pray according to how Jesus taught Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation.